Welcome to Streams of Income with self-help author Ryan Rieger. For the next hour, you'll hear proven methods for how to live the multiple income streams dream. Ryan is passionate about helping others discover their gifts and start their own business. He's published five books, and his courses and group coaching programs have changed the lives of thousands of students all over the world. Ryan's books include Private Label, The Easy Way, Finding Your Grace Place, and his latest, Streams of Income. And now, here's your host, Ryan Rieger. Hey guys, welcome back to the Streams of Income radio show. I'm your host, Ryan Rieger. Today, we're chatting with my new friend, Kathleen McElwain. She is an artist. She grew up in Oklahoma, now lives in Texas. She has an awesome story of how she uh, at one point thought that her dream was going to be on the shelf and she uh, her she and her husband moved to Texas from Oklahoma for him to attend seminary for him to become a pastor and she thought for a, a season that um, she had given up her dream for her husband's dream of being a pastor but God brought that back to her she started p- doing paintings on a bus on her way to work each day and became known as the bus painting lady. And a lot of articles are written written for for her or about her. And uh, she lives in the Austin area. But she has an awesome story and just of how she grew up and how um, the Lord used art in her life uh, to be a blessing to others. And now she's turned that into a business. She sells fabric quilt pieces she sells um she has prints on bookmarks and on cards uh, my friend linda joseph who was our mutual friend sent some to me and they're gorgeous you got to check out um her site it's texasartshop.com also waterbrushteacher.com so i would encourage you you i know you a lot of people listen to this podcast audio but check out the youtube version of this because she shows some of her art and you you're not going to miss anything by not listening to it but she, you want to see her art it's so awesome and um she just does a great job but check out those sites waterbrushteacher.com she has a class that's going to start in february in which she takes you through how to do this it's for beginners and then if you want it turns into a monthly membership for you those that want to go further even in her class she teaches you how to sell your art um but that class will start in february um she created her own lap kit for for travel with watercolor she's an amazing lady somebody that um i'm super excited to meet and jump on a separate call with to um, help her think through some ideas of how to turn this even into more business for her but super sweet lady I, my new best friend here is my interview with kathleen this is kathleen welcome to streams of income it's such an honor to meet you oh it's an honor to meet you ryan and thank you for inviting me oh. Of course. And so guys, if you listening to this, you have to watch this on video. Just go to YouTube and watch this episode or go to the streams of income radio.com um, because she has beautiful paintings in the background of, of of her where she's at right now in her office. And her we have a mutual friend, Linda Joseph, who's also been on this podcast. And Linda sent me some gorgeous cards from Kathleen that Kathleen painted. And so um, definitely check her out. We'll put links in the show notes where you can find her. I think the what you do would be great gifts. We're right in the, this actually will probably air this Friday. So we got oh, cool. plenty of time for somebody that's listening to want to, if they want to give these as gifts, which they'd make amazing gifts for people to go there. So we'll put those links here in a minute. But Kathleen, tell me your story. We were talking a little bit before we hit record and um, getting to know you, but I, I want to hear your story and let's share it with the listeners. Well, I start, my story seems to start with today, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just um, so important to me business wise, that people kind of know who I am as an artist, because if I was still trying to sell art, like I was 50 years ago, Mm -hmm. and make it in business that way, um, it just wouldn't work. There would there would be nothing. But I found out I really wasn't happy in that world. That was I didn't find my people there. Yeah. And I think going back into my childhood when I first started seeing myself as an artist is the best place to start. And I'll try to make the story. I'll go for it. Go as long and, as you okay. want. Whatever. I enjoy this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So when I was 12 years old, I didn't know how to read and I didn't, I hadn't learned any math. And when a teacher would try to 
teach me something or get me to do something in the classroom, I w- would become so anxious. I remember my eyes bouncing in my head. I wow. really do. And if they reached over and held me, which in the 50s, that was, you know, that that meant they cared, really, yeah. um, um, you know, back then. But um, that would make me so anxious that I was capable of kicking somebody and running away. <laughs> I mean, it was behavior wise, I could not be trusted. Mm. And um, there were two people that really, really did beautiful with me. And one was my dad, who was an all around cowboy. And we raised quarter horses at my house. Wow. Are you and from he, Texas? Originally? Uh, no, okay. Oklahoma, no. Okay. Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yes. Awesome. And um, he graduated from Oklahoma State University the year that the PRCA Cowboy, Rodeo Cowboys, were established. And um, he was one of the recipients of one of the first team um, uh, trophies. That's so awesome. um yeah it was it was i mean my dad is what's called a real cowboy you know yeah, do you think that's why and i want to i wanted to uh, um make sure we get all your your story but just curious does that why is that why your art is more cowboy slash texas focused uh yes that yeah. was definitely uh, see my dad was everything interesting and uh challenging and mm. Oh my gosh, this is awful because we had lots of brood mares that would have babies every year and we'd go out to the pasture and it was like discovery. Oh my goodness, there's another baby. <laughs> and, uh, but then also there would be the accident. There would be the, the foal that fell into the creek, you know, and got torn up and all kinds of things. And so I was, there was a lot of real life, whether it was going into my barn, our barn, or, you know, going to feed the horses with my dad. But he also worked for cattlemen. So I saw lots of different cows, uh, kinds of cows growing up. And I remember watching the Longhorns and just, I remember thinking it looked like a ballet. You know, they'd move so gracefully and everything. And I, I consider the Longhorn the smartest cow out there for sure. But they're definitely survivors. So their story tells that. But um, my dad was that. And then my mom was everything beautiful. I mean, inside of our house, the art on the walls, the flowers on the table, the tablecloth. And that's what a lot of moms put that kind of pressure on themselves in the 50s. And, you know, we were greeted at the front door with our snacks. And wow. and um, it was it was a different world than we live in now. But I was safe every place I went. I'd go to the barn and get on my horse and and I was gone until dinner time and I was safe. I mean, there weren't things going on that that right. were a problem. And so, but but I had that problem with learning. And I had an older sister that was, you know, the top of the class. And I had a younger sister that everybody loved to have around her, mm-hmm. around them. And then there was me. And it was just not a good thing at all. And I was in the middle. And um so my dad was a real practical man and he was just like some way or another kathleen has to learn a trade she has to learn something that she can do to take care of herself when she grows up and he had a good friend that was an artist and he didn't my dad didn't necessarily think that art was you know the best way for me to go but he knew that was the only thing i was interested in because i wanted to draw the horses and i wanted to draw you know everything around me so um, there goes that m- mom with the beauty and my dad with all the interesting things. And so I I was given the opportunity to take art lessons from a really wonderful artist, Jay O'Melia. And he was um, very um, professional and knew exactly what he was doing. He was highly trained in art and highly trained in teaching. And he was teaching University of Tulsa art students on Saturday morning. And he invited me to come learn in that during that same period of time. And so I had this little corner of the room in the vestibule of, you know, his studio. And I stood and did all of my art for as long as I was with Jay. And he would 
tell me what to do when I first got there. And it would be using his materials. And then he would leave me and he'd go through the room and take care of all of his uh, University of Tulsa students. Uh And then he would come back to me. And he never said good or bad or right or wrong. He would just change his instructions. And so then I had a new drawing to do. And so... um, We went quickly from charcoal, what's called value drawing, that sort of thing, to watercolor. And he taught me how to sketch with watercolor. Mm -hmm. And then when I could accomplish a composition that he was happy with, and the way I knew he was happy with it was he would take me to the next step, was then I could do it larger with either pastel Mm -hmm. sticks or I was working with oil paint. And um, so quickly I was, but what was happening inside of me was I was learning how to learn. Mm. I had something, he was teaching me something I really wanted to learn. I knew my behavior had to be just perfect, but he was so gentle and so caring yeah. that I really responded to it. And um, And so, and I remember telling Jay that I was an artist and that that I wanted to sell my art like he did and like some of the students that I'd learned about. And he said, well, the only thing that's missing is you have to figure out a way to make your art a service to Mm. people. Mm. Well, that's a hard hard thing for a 15 year old or a 16 year old. And so I had a lot to think about. But did you have a question? <laughs> no, I'm just thinking about that. I make your art a service. Right, an art is service. And so when I, um, okay, so I went to college for a while. I managed to do one year, full year of college. And, and I did take more college courses, but they were always to meet a need. You know, like I wanted to learn more about marketing. I wanted to learn more account about counting or bookkeeping. And I still was very lacking in a lot of, um, so reading is my hardest, the hardest thing for me. Um, takes me a long time to get through a paragraph of uh, instruction and just, you know, words that you'd think that everybody would understand just trip me up and I really have trouble. I never took any algebra. There's no um, geometry in my background. Um, and so, but I did end up in banking and actually in a brokerage industry with my Series 7 ex- uh, license, but I was an operations manager for them. And, um, you know, so I didn't have to use it in the same way, but these were back in those service days. Yeah. And so the way I became a service, because I didn't want to let go of the art in any way, shape or form, was I started painting pet paintings for people okay. and paintings of their grandchildren and, you know, Mother's Day gifts that were just right, the f- perfect flower or whatever. And so that was the way I interpreted that service. And when my husband and I got married, I was doing that sort of thing, you know, for, um, you know, not necessarily for income, but just to be that artist. So um, streams of income to me were um, different subjects, you know, whether it was a child, grandchild, or, you know, painting a grandma or or family together or the pet or, you know, whatever it was that those were the different, oh, I can do that. You know, the, that. Did you get, so you actually got paid for those though, right? But it was more of a side hustle at that time. Absolutely. Yeah. That, and that was a side hustle, even starting in college, you know, Mm -hmm. so it was just something I didn't let go of, but there was a point at which my husband caught on to what I was selling those paintings for and things. And he was just like, we can't buy our supplies. If you're not going to do more that, you know, this is going to have to pay for itself. And that's when I became a little more serious about it and started doing some of the art fairs and Mm -hmm. looking for galleries that I could be in. And I was happy to be in a fabric, I mean, in a, in a, a store that sold furniture because the person that owned the store would 
take my painting and a chair and a table and a lamp and put them together and yeah. people would buy the whole set, you know, that's including awesome. my painting. So <laughs> it was, you just have to be willing and yeah. that's, that's all it takes. But I was not becoming known as an artist mm -hmm. and really I wasn't all of those years. I really wasn't happy with that form. If I was in a gallery, the gallery owner didn't want me talking to just anybody in the room because they may have been here for somebody else's art. Mm. And that was so hard for me because most artists don't know how to talk about their art. And mm. I knew what people wanted to know and I knew yeah. how to talk to people. And so I was real uncomfortable when I was a gallery artist. So it, it wasn't my, my group of people, but learning how to learn with the art was um a life changer to me mm -hmm. it um um a lot of people when i've described my conduct they see it as being somebody that was on the spectrum mm -hmm. uh, i don't have any idea there's some things i have never been able to overcome but there's some things i've overcome just just beautifully and so yeah. that has um been real important but um in 2004, we moved to uh, Austin, Texas for my husband to go to seminary. And we had been married, see, we've been married 43 years now. So, um, and it's 2021 now. Oh, it's 22, almost 23. Yeah. But um, I went from having a bedroom for an art studio to having a kitchen table in the apartment we were in. Mm. And so I knew I couldn't be painting in oil at that kitchen table. So I started painting in watercolor primarily mm -hmm. in 2004. And I went to work for University of Texas. I could walk to work um, from where we were living at seminary. And um, the art, um, the opportunity to share my art became greater and greater mm. because the uh, artist in residence at um, Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary invited me to do art shows. And so I was doing uh, uh, some art that I can consider to be Christian art. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that was um, a beginning opportunity for me to really begin to connect my art with my personal relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, one of the things that happened was when my husband graduated in 2008, um, we wanted to stay in Texas and he became the pastor of Leander Presbyterian Church. And mm -hmm. we bought a house here in Leander. And I was still working at the University of Texas. In fact, he took that job pretty much because I had my job at University of Texas. Mm -hmm. And so first day here in our home, uh, quarter of six in the morning, I get on a bus and ride an hour and a half from door to door. Wow. You know, I would leave our my house and an hour and a half later, I'm going through the door at work. And all that time on the bus is the time that I used to paint, you know, I used to walk to work just in a yeah. short time before that. And um, three weeks into that time, I hadn't had any time to paint. And that was a real hardship on me. And I honestly believed that I had traded my dream, mm. which my husband had always been so supportive of with my art for his dream of, being a pastor and and um and his the call on his life mm -hmm. and um i i i think i would have been willing to do it um um so i in a way i sort of resigned myself to that a little bit but i knew it was okay for me to be painting anytime i possibly could mm -hmm. and so i got all the things out that i had taken with me to England went on a trip to so that I could paint in watercolor on location during that time. 
And um, because we were going into small communities and I had just had a lot of time on my hands and I had really enjoyed watercolor painting during that time. But what I wanted was a travel something that I could paint on the bus. Uh And so I created um, what I call a watercolor lap palette. And so the palette is the colors that Uh the artist uses. That's what makes up the actual palette. Yeah. And I chose which colors I wanted on that palette. Uh-huh. And I I didn't want it to be too much, you know, to work with. I just wanted the minimum, sort of. And then I had, had acquired, actually, when I was in England, this water brush. So this brush holds the water. Yeah. And uh, they have three different sizes. And I had three different sizes at the time, Um but so you just unscrew it. There's uh-huh. nothing blocking you from being able to just fill the brush with water and, you know, uh-huh. screw the brush back on it. Uh-huh. And I had good habits. And so the cap would always go on the back of the brush. Uh-huh. And so every day um, I pictured myself, oh, in small paper, you know, small sheets uh-huh. of watercolor paper and then paper towel. And you so sell that is like a like if I wanted to buy that, for example, is that a set that you sell? If you if you have the opportunity to buy this, most likely you're one of my students. Okay. So that's is that something that you created? You created that it's whole thing? It's something I created completely. It um um that well, yes, no. So this is a component, uh-huh. the palette, the uh-huh. little plastic box that makes yep. up this palette and then this is a canvas board okay and it is adhered with velcro okay and i do not i'm not i don't object to telling people all about this at all and they can make their own they can do this by any art supply store carries all these materials Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a wonderful thing to just literally set on your lap yeah. And paint any place you are. You can go, yeah. you know, out in your own garden. You can do quick sketches of birds. You can all of those things. Is there anything and, like, so I know I don't want to get too far off here, but it brings me an idea. And it's probably something Linda's already thought of is, <laughs> um, is that something that you could, or even be interested in selling on like Etsy or Amazon, a complete kit like that, um, with those, with those components? Yes, if I didn't have to do all of it myself. Yeah, yeah, no, I yes. totally think it could be outsourced. Like, um, there, um, you know, and I'll I'll make sure that Linda hears this conversation because she's would be the one to help you out with this. But I think, um, I know she's help. She's assembling kits, card kits for you right now. But I think it could be done like in a prep center, to where um, a company that has a warehouse that would fulfill those orders for you, that they would have a case of, of each of the items. And then they would just get an email every time you got a sale and they would know to take this piece, this piece, this piece, box it up together and ship it out to the customer for you. So I think that's a very real opportunity, especially if you feel like you have the audience to do it, or if it might, I mean, it'd be very easy to test it on Etsy or Amazon or eBay, or there might even be an art type of site that you could list on potentially. Right. And I picture that also being sold with a how to watercolor and yes. introductory type class. Totally. Book. Absolutely. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We could brainstorm all day long. I want to hear more of your story <laughs> and I'll come up with other ideas as we go along. But um, so you were, um, you're on the bus and you are painting on the way to work. Yeah. Well, the very first day I got there, I got everything out. And the reason it had to be so you know, th- just this way is because the bus has a lot of movement <laughs> and a lot of unexpected stops and yes. jerks and that sort of thing. And it goes every direction, you know, it's sideways yeah. and forward. And you can't have like and, a jar of water sitting there. You've got to have no, it. You that couldn't, water yeah, you to had to have brush. something, <laughs> you know. And so I had to be able to keep everything in my hands. Yeah. And so I got on the bus that first day with my lap palette is what I started calling it. And I... um I thought about everything except what was I going to paint. And I started 
I started just my brain was it was back to those eyes bouncing in my head, you know, anxiety about this, because I knew if I didn't paint that day, I was probably not going to try to do that anymore. I mean, it took a lot of nerve and confidence. And I had to stop thinking about the other 59 people that were sitting in seats on the bus. And the ones, you know, I'm in the first set, first place the bus stops, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I'm the first people on the bus. And so everybody was going to walk by me yes. <laughs> as they got on. And I, my favorite place on the bus had already become right behind the um, bus driver, primarily because my mind can wonder, and I don't even know I've gotten to my bus stop. And so I knew I needed to be someplace that I was real aware of what was going on around me. <laughs> it, 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 it happened a few times. So I know what I'm talking about, but Anyway, so I was so anxious to, I just said, I have to put something on this paper. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the thought comes, I have to do it so it looks nice so people don't think I'm just crazy. Right. <laughs> you know, it had to be good. It yeah. couldn't just be. But for some reason or other, I thought of my mom. And I thought about my mom walking up my the steps to my grandmother's front porch, mm -hmm. carrying a pot of geraniums in a clay pot. You know, something I had lots of memories of. And, and I painted, um, <laughs> I've lost it now. Um, um, I had an example of my geranium painting right here, but the, um, but I painted a geranium and by the time we got to my, uh, destination, it was still a little bit wet and I was just so happy about it, but I, I put a journal in my purse. And so I could, I just stuck the wet painting into the journal paper so that it was kind of blotted in between the two mm -hmm. sheets. Mm -hmm. And I, I got off the bus and it was busy from that point on. And all day long, I had such a sense of satisf satisfaction mm -hmm. about that painting. And in my mind, it was the most beautiful painting I'd ever painted in my life. And I just, um, I couldn't wait to see it again. I mean, it was really, really a day of full of hope and, yeah. and uh, everything. And so I got back on the bus at the end of the day and I was real tired and I got it out and I just loved it. It was, it was wonderful, but it didn't seem finished to me. Mm -hmm. And so I got a black pen out of my purse and I did these lines around it. I just added a little bit of flair to the painting. Mm -hmm. And um, years to come, there were a lot of articles that were written about this time. They called me the bus paintings artist. <laughs> and, um, but one of the writers of an article called it Texas whimsy. Mm -hmm. And then she adds her Texas whimsy. And it was the black lines that I yeah. did on the paintings. And so for the first time in my career as an artist, <clears throat> I had a style that was connected, that was recognized as my style. Now you go online right now and hundreds of thousands of artists are painting black lines around their their art. And I do take a little bit of credit for that because that was also the beginning of Facebook. Mm. And, and I had a nephew that had just gone um, and well, he was in the military and he'd gone overseas and none of us could know where he was. And in the morning, early in the morning, when I was first getting up, he was, it was the end of his day and he would get on Facebook and he would talk to his family and there would just be, you know, some exchange there, you know, from the day before or whatever. But I always couldn't wait to find out, you know, to see, see him. Uh, you couldn't see him. He sometimes shared b pictures of his boots, yeah. but, um, but, at the same time, I gained confidence and I wanted to share with his wife, my niece, mm -hmm. the art I was doing. Mm -hmm. And so I started sharing my art very early on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And so those bus paintings and the personality of that person painting on the bus became that. 
A lot of things, and I need to tell this real quickly, um, I think, but the um, those were the greatest years of my art career because I learned so much about myself. Yeah. Those people on the bus were daycare workers, uh, parking lot attendants. They were not the people that I knew had known as buyers of art. Mm -hmm. And nobody ever offered to buy one of my paintings, but every single one of them wanted to sit down with me and watch me paint. And they all had their own questions and they all had a grandma or an aunt or a cousin. And those were things that I had hated to hear always before i thought well why do i care why would that matter mm -hmm. but i realized that those people really more than anything else wanted to connect with the art yeah we love art and we don't even know it it's not something that's visible or available the artists themselves the temperament the personality is unknown un misunderstood I had a man one day sit down with me when I was trying to paint some blackbirds mm -hmm. and he began to tell me what I was doing wrong. <laughs> the first thing I said to him was, are you an artist? And no, no, but it's obvious, you know, what you're doing, you know? And so I right then, you know, thought to myself, the nerve of him, mm -hmm. but this was somebody I had seen get on the bus, you know, day after day. And I thought I have to, I have to get along with this man. <laughs> right. I, you know, he's somebody that I have to know from this day forward. And I swallowed that angst. I yeah. said, I did not take offense to it. And I began to really learn about how important it was for me as a Christian, somebody that loved the Lord to connect with anybody that was willing to sit down and connect mm. with me mm. and um arrogance and pride and um great accomplishment and everything all went in to that moment in mm. an odd sort of way i became the person that i wanted to be mm. and in my art in my relationship with the Lord. And I began to really use those experiences in a different way. Mm -hmm. And when um, in 2000, and um, well, shortly, probably during those same days, I had had a designer come to me that wanted me to help them develop, um, not develop, but um, create tablecloths for VIP products parties for University of Texas um, mm -hmm. uh, parties. So tablecloths and napkins and what they wanted was fabric with longhorns on it. Well, I had loved the idea of my art on fabric. Mm -hmm. I never thought it would happen, but um, we had now gone to the place that it was digital printing, more digital printing on fabric. And so I was given an opportunity to learn about it and begin to develop that. Um, so there was my first licensing opportunities. I began to learn about licensing and more cus custom work um, on a different level, printing my art on something besides just paper or prints, art prints. Well, the newspaper articles that had written been written about me, the Bob Bullock came to me and said, we want our thank you note to be one of your longhorns. And we want to license that image. Well, very quickly, I asked them if they would sell prints mm -hmm. of my art in their store, in the gift shop there. And my art ended up in all of the state parks because wow. of that um, request. And I'm not a businesswoman. And had I done it any different, I probably wouldn't have had my art in those places. But I learned the importance of um, sharing my art on that level mm -hmm. could do nothing but good for me. There was yeah. not... It wasn't the amount of money charged. It was the opportunity that was important. Um, UT Co-op came to me and wanted an image that they could put on T-shirts. Mm -hmm. And here, as I walked around the campus, I would see students wearing my art. Oh, that's cool. It was. <laughs> and then, um, and so I was learning how to do the fabric 
and I knew that um, I've got a I've got a whole um, file cabinet full of art that I did on the bus, and you know, and during those times, and so selling art was out of the question. Licensing opportunities were few and far between, really, but um, important, but few and far between. And so I wanted to develop a business with my art on the fabric. Mm. And um, so I learned that since the beginning of time, I suspect that we have had quilters, people that made blankets mm -hmm. out of fabric, uh, cut up little pieces, sew them back together, make mm -hmm. these beautiful quilts. And so I decided that quilters were going to be my end customer mm -hmm. and that I was going to create a business with my art on fabric that sold in gift shops. No, I'm sorry, fabric stores, wholesale. Yeah. So um, I got out of that retail thinking and um, knew that I wanted to market to the stores. Mm -hmm. I wanted it because I wanted large quantities. I wasn't ever going to be able to make any money if it was just one little print of my art at a time, I needed to sell a whole yard of it. Yeah. Um, and now I have licenses with with um, um, QT Fabrics, which is one of the oldest textile companies here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And they sell yardage of my, my art. Mm -hmm. And it is only sold in the fabric shops. But also, I have a website called Quilt Blocks Art that the stores can buy a quantity of my prints okay. on fabric. Okay. And I have about 200 images they can choose from. Oh, nice. So it's, it was uh, long in the development, but uh -huh. there's two sizes that I sell. Mm -hmm. And this is the size of one quilt block. Okay. And it's actually, it comes to them as a nine by 10 um, block of fabric mm -hmm. on a yard that they cut up themselves. But I also ha have something that's called small blocks. Okay. And um, what is so wonderful about both the things that you see, see here are, I guess, what I call cottage industries. Um, maybe single mom that wants to make extra money sews mm -hmm. things and sells them at craft fairs and, and yes. places like that. I have a lot of people that do that sort of thing. I have, there's one that you can send her a blue jean jacket and she creates an image that is kind of thematic to your lifestyle. Okay. And most of the time she's using art that I have on that website. And so it's a, it's a wonderful Texas um, product as well as all over the nation and actually all over the world at this stage. Um, somebody that uh, Linda probably has already thought of to contact, but um, maybe I don't know if she's told you this name, but Jason and cinnamon miles, they, um, and I'll, I'll write that down for you and send it over okay. to you. Um, and maybe I'll send an email to you and Linda together with just, but, um, she knows Jason pretty well. I don't know if she's talked to him in a while, but she, he and her, and, um, he and cinnamon have a, a platform, an online sales platform called pixie fair. And okay. it's, it's for sewers. So like, if I wanted to sew things and sell them, um, I know you may not want to sell, you you may not want to sell to the end customer, but all of their sewers could be potential customers of yours because they may buy your your quilt blocks and create something else with it. So that would just be a good connection. They also have a um, a nonprofit organization called So Powerful, and it's in I think in Zambia, and they go there fairly often, and they um, they have their they have a team of people who create. Um, these uh, bags for ladies um, and they sell them there and they raise money. So um, that's just, that would be a good connection for you. Jason. That is, it sounds wonderful. Right. Like Definitely. Yeah. 
Wow. So that primarily um, what you're doing now, I know you got your um, your online classes. I want to get to that too. So what else are you, as far as um, the, the licensing, is that the main thing is the quilt blocks? Um, the, the quilt blocks um, isn't a licensing unless it's just licensing to myself because it is a product um, that I've developed and sell. Mm -hmm. um, the watercolor classes, I still have strong licensing um, opportunities. One of the stores here in Austin that's been around for a very long time called me last week and asked for six new images for T-shirts. Wow, so you have and to go, like to this, go and create those? Right. And so uh, this, like, this is one that is uh, my art. Um, I, um, I have... Um, I have marketed with this bookmark uh -huh. now since 2013. Uh -huh. um, it um, is a painting that I did, uh, you know, large, yeah. and then uh, took it into a bookmark, and uh -huh. um, it's my business card. Oh, that's you know? awesome. Uh huh. And so I, I give it to people and they go, Oh, I have one of those. And, it, you know, and I'll usually give people two and I'll say yeah. one for you and one to give away. And, yeah. and they, they love that. You know, we love our longhorns here in Texas for sure. The other thing we love in Texas are blue bonnets. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the first blue bonnet I ever painted. And I painted it on the bus, you wow. know, a, and that was that was kind of as the as an oaky. I really had not seen very many blue bonnets up close. Right. But um, when I painted this one, mm. um, was when I really had an idea of what a blue bonnet looked like. And I teach. This is the second painting in all of the beginning classes. Mm -hmm. Is I teach them to do this. That's awesome. And Give me a good, good quick question. I'm thinking about from the person listening to this. Um, I have some people that do print on demand. So let's say, for example, there's somebody that um, is selling uh, Western style things already. And, and you can tell me if you don't want to talk about this publicly or not sure if you don't want to. Maybe it's more of a negotiation. But is it possible to give me an idea of like if I came to you and said, I'm already selling Western stuff. I love your longhorns. Can you create? a longhorn for me that I can put on a mug. Is that, a, can you give me some type of an idea of a number of how much that would cost somebody to have uh, you create uh, one? Um, or would you just give them one that you've already created? Well, all of the, all of those pos are possible. I'm still painting longhorns. This is okay. one back here that I've just, you know, recently painted and, and um, the, um, all of those paintings back there are pretty, Actually, most of them were done in November. Okay. <laughs> so that's how prolific I am. But um, the one of the things when I do a custom painting, I don't, I won't take any money for that painting. It has to meet the need. Mm. So I do not. The value of this painting mm. is not there until it has been used. Okay. And you know, created a. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm perfectly happy to sell that to them later if it's a successful thing, but I really would prefer the royalties in the... Um, Got it. So if I wanted to sell a mug with a longhorn, you would create it. Essentially, you're creating it for free. And then um, when it sells, we would just come to some a royalty agreement for everyone that sells, you get X number of dollars. Right. I have um, I have people that are doing that with fabric. There's a, a, a young lady that does um, chiffon scarves for men mm -hmm. um, that have longhorns on it. You know, University of Texas has had a great, great season and yeah. she has done just amazing with the sale of this. Yeah. And I um, see one of the things that I, I don't want to um, um be remorse and i mean i don't want to not uh share and i'm going to stand up so Go for it. <laughs> this is a new product of mine and um they are chiffon scarves okay and um much um 
you know, I'm in a gallery with them wow. in Marble Falls right now, and they're doing really well um, mm -hmm. on this. This has given me new purpose with yeah. my art. Um, this is the painting that this one came from. Uh -huh. And um, and so, again, I know how to do the fabric. Now, this is not a product, you know, after I paint the painting, put it on the fabric, uh -huh. then I have to pay somebody to sew it for me. Yeah. Then it is sold. But it, ha it created an opportunity for me to, again, be a gallery artist. Yeah. And, you know, the world's changed for me, and I'm very comfortable with that. Yeah with that place now. And wow. so, and that's something that Linda really, you know, hopes that we have um, yeah. <laughs> represented going forward. Um, also, I want to teach classes on journaling mm. and um, um, the, the journaling um, that I do is very, is real centered in my Bible study, mm -hmm. you know, but I also think that we do so many things in such a hurry and get the job done and just do it a certain way mm -hmm. that we are not able to ponder mm -hmm. what we've learned. And, you know, throughout scripture, it's the, um, the opportunity to ponder. I mean, I wrote down this morning in Psalms 143.5, I remember days of old. I ponder all your great works and think about what you have done. Oh, that's so good. And um, so over the years of painting, I have learned how to get quiet, mm -hmm. really quiet my anxieties and quiet myself. And, um, what I spend time thinking about is, you know, the work of God in me or in other people, or, you know, sometimes it's a prayer, you know, time of prayer, but I want to teach that as a workshop. So that's something yeah. that's coming soon. Um, I always thought that my works, my writings would someday be published, but I realized that the way the Lord has taken this mm -hmm. in me is to teach me kind of how to teach others mm. to do that. Um, and, you know, really and truly people can do it with whatever Bible study they're in yeah. and it's just offering another dimension. So I'm, I'm real excited about that. Right? I love that. Let's talk about, um, I think probably what we, sh I could talk to you forever because I have all kinds of questions. Um, but I think if we could, me, you and Linda could get on a call and just have a brainstorming session and some of these ideas that I have, you could say, yeah, that's, that's great, but maybe not a fit for me. And just think through some of that stuff with Linda, who's helping you out. So let's get that scheduled. But I want to hear about the, um, how you've moved from selling the actual artwork, you've got the licensing now, and now you're teaching people how to do watercolor, which is so cool. So tell me about that program that you have. So I um, I developed, there's, uh, well, actually I have eight paintings, but I've kind of gotten the class down to five that I teach people how to watercolor paint the way I learn to watercolor. Mm -hmm. So I go back to those very basics at 12 years old, yeah. you know, the, this is how you're successful. And the students not only get real hands-on instruction. I have this wonderful camera that's called the ladybug that teachers use. It's it's a new, what's called a document camera, but they're able to watch my hands and they, it is actually better than a classroom experience oh, with wow. watercolor. When I was teaching oil painting and I could be up at the front and everybody could kind of see what was happening or gather around and see it on that kind of a, but watercolor is painted pretty much flat, maybe a little bit of an incline, but, yeah. um, this document camera makes that experience so real mm -hmm. that they're really able to follow suit and That's learn. Awesome. And um, and so I want students to go through that that beginners or introductory class. I mean, some of these people are advanced painters and just wanting to get back to basics and wanting that new inspiration and yeah. um, you know, in a sense, kind of fall in love again with watercolor. But um, and it's a short time, but I I think one of my greatest um, contributions really was in with what the colors are. Mm 
yeah. and how to use these colors. And so, which this is um, actually Daniel Smith watercolor paint, mm -hmm. and you see a sign back there that says Daniel Smith. Mm -hmm. I'm a Daniel Smith ambassador of water yeah. of their watercolor paint, and I took these ten colors, uh -huh. and I have made it so that students can really really learn so much about it and at the end of that time they know if they want to stay with me yeah. and so i move students from a tuesday morning on zoom class into a monday morning um two hour session mm -hmm. with other students and i i can take a lot of students in a class mm -hmm. like that everybody gets one-on-one -on -one attention yeah. because they are looking at what i'm doing and they're able to ask questions and we we have success at the end of every class mm -hmm. everybody paints the same thing and what I find is that's what builds confidence is yeah. at the end of the class, they can go show what they've done and they know that they were successful and that they did it. That's and nice. I, uh, it's been, uh, well, actually for years and years, this was the only beginner class I taught mm -hmm. and people would just go on from there. I mean, literally just go on from there because I would jam pack it into one class. Yeah. Um, but again, the palette really mattered because I taught them. See, you know, when you buy um, paint like this, you know, uh, everybody can afford a little thing of prying. And this is what I, this is the same brand I painted with when I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm from at my own home yeah. and these have the primaries and the secondary colors in it they pretty much have the same colors just a different brand mm -hmm. but the thing about it is is they have trouble getting color well why do they have trouble getting color i teach those things mm -hmm. they they do this and then they say well i'm not good at this they put it away and they don't try anymore they're missing the things that i teach yes and um and so i i think if people will take that beginner class from me they will be on their way and if they will come on to my studio class it changes their life that's it's, awesome so you you wanted so the um the six week class that you do that's something that's a prerequisite in order to join your membership and when is your next, um, do you have an, a date set for your next six week yes, class? I'm going to start a new beginners in February. The, nice. Probably the first nice. Tuesday in February is the plan. What's the, um, if somebody wants to join that, do you, I know you said you're working on the website and it's not done yet, but is there, do you know what link that's going to be? It's um, waterbrushteacher.com. Got it. And on the front page, I have a sign up for my newsletter. Okay. It's the first thing they'll see. And it just asks them for their first name and their email address. And they'll start getting my newsletter, which has, I've, I teach, uh, I come on Zoom every Saturday morning free. Mm -hmm. And um, my, my, platform or what I do is uh, a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, some, some of the times I do something different. Some of the times we just do a painting together and I just kind of let them know that I'm out there and this is who I am. And it's, yeah, I try to not go over an hour Saturday morning who has the time to do this. Mm -hmm. um, but um now I've started trying to invite other artists to come on and kind of introduce how they teach also, because it doesn't bother me for people to do comparisons mm -hmm. because I think I'm more foundational than yeah. most, most people. That's so good. who would, do you feel like yeah. this is for people who want to turn this into a business and people that just want to do it for fun? Absolutely. That's Absolutely. Um, yeah. I think everybody should find ways to uh, create and with companies like Spoonflower being able to put it on fabric. Uh -huh. um, I mean, and most of the students that do go on and sell some art, mm -hmm. they start out by the gift giving. Mm. 
Yeah. You know, because that's how we see our art is yeah. it's a gift. Yeah. And I just did this because I, you know, I painted a painting of their pet it goes back to that service um, opportunity so in good. learning. And so many of my students are involved in their churches mm -hmm. and uh, people are excited for them. And, um, you know, it's a great thing to do um, at a time in your life that things are changing. Yeah. You know, and maybe at a time in your life that you're not happy mm. with the way things are changing. Mm. Um, um, real quick story. I had a student that I taught how to paint this, mm -hmm. not that one, this one. <laughs> and she bought the palette, mm -hmm. uh, didn't know anything about her. The next time I saw her was at another beginner's class, and she told me that she had covenanted with her sister to be with her during every uh, cancer treatment that she had. Mm -hmm. And so apparently that's a large room with a lot of people that are um, dealing with a lot of hard things yeah. and sometimes family members with them. And she said, I went in with her. She had actually had her, her cancer had reoccurred, and so she was familiar with all of this. So she took the palette of paint in with her mm -hmm. and sat down with her sister. And she said, I just made myself get it out and start painting. And she said, I didn't have anything to paint. Reminded me of that first day on the bus. Mm -hmm. And she said, I just started putting color down on the paper mm -hmm. and doing what you taught me to do. And she said, in no time at all, people all over that room were stretching their neck, trying to see what I was doing. <laughs> yeah. And it changed the whole attitude in that room. Oh. And she said, I painted when we went in for her to have her cancer treatment every time wow. from that point on and she was it was in remission now and they weren't having That's to do that anymore mm -hmm. and so i felt like that was the greatest story of all and yes. uh, this is a person that has stayed in my life that <laughs> yes that is so, so neat wow well wow 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 well what's um I, i'm eager to get on a call with you and linda to what do you feel like for you moving forward is your, the thing, cause you could do so many different things. You're, you have so many options and that's not, you know, you don't want to do everything. You can't do everything. Do you want to focus more on the getting people into your membership? Is that kind of where you want to really I think focus that's, your efforts? I, I think yeah. that's really important. Um, yeah. Ryan, I'm 71 years old. It's not easy to see my future the same way I've always seen it. Mm. And um, um, an artist's work, um, you know, it becomes kind of a life work. And I really believe that those people that take those classes from me are going to be the the thing that hands down to the That's next awesome. generation your legacy wow right and so it is that legacy that i'm i'm most interested in um because there's no way i can possibly imagine what that is yeah. um so wow. yes do you have the people underneath like with some of the ideas that we may think about and talk about are there people that are students of yours that it might be an idea like hey ryan that's a really good idea it's not for me but I know somebody who would be really good at that. Do you have Do you have students that are at the level that you feel like they could have cards that they sell online? They could also have quilt fabric um, oh, made with their ab art. Absolutely, okay. I do. Okay. Absolutely, I do. And mm -hmm. um, and you know the camaraderie is so strong that they become as much of a coach wow. during their classes as uh, during my classes. That's neat. And that's one of the reasons why I want to do that on Saturday mornings of having the interview opportunities, because I want some of these students to know how important what they have learned is. Yes. And, um, so Saturday mornings, I just want that format of come learn from this person, too. So, yeah. Wow. Yes. Okay. Where's the best place? You've given me the waterbrushteacher.com. We've also got the Quilt Blocks Art site. What What's the main place for people to find you? What's the like one one place you want them to go? Um, I'd, I'd probably the sign up for my newsletter. Okay. On yeah, the waterbrushteacher.com. Water teacher. Okay. Right. On the homepage. 
Uh, let me know. You can reply to it. It's a constant contact newsletter. And mm -hmm. so you can reply and, and let me know who you are and, and why, you know, whatever, whatever reason. Every one of both my websites have a contact me link. Uh -huh. You know, if you're at a place in your life that one more newsletter is just more than you can handle, you okay. know, please send me an email from yeah. from that source. Actually, my phone number and my email address is at the bottom of both of those websites. Okay. So. Um, and where can people, if they want to buy the, like the Linda sent me those cards, if people want to buy that or the bookmarks or anything like that, where do they go for that? TexasArtShop.com. TexasArtShop.com. Wow. And that's our Etsy store. Okay. Love it. And there is more good news to come on that. It's well, I'm excited to hear about that. Let's uh, let's stay in touch and um, I'll set up a call. I mean, let, hang on for after we record the recording. We'll, we'll um, talk about when we can maybe jump back on another call. But thank you for being on my show. I really appreciate it. It's been an honor to meet you. And I love your story and everything that you're doing. Thank you, Ryan. I've really enjoyed it. You've been listening to Streams of Income with self-help author Ryan Rieger. From right here in the Dallas Metroplex, Ryan teaches several entrepreneurial courses and group coaching programs to students all over the world. Be sure to listen next week at the same time for Streams of Income with Ryan Rieger.